So I think we're now ready to have the Act 166 implementation team q and I'm assuming that you guys are going to have, have some brief remarks and then we can start throwing questions your way. Is that the idea? Well, or you wanna? well how about I just um, what we were going to do was just um, invite any of the state council members, um, anyone in the room who have had any questions, um, and um, maybe invite you all to update us on uh, recent recent activity around the guidance and, and the latest document, uh, the guidance document that was put out very recently. And then um, once you kind of update us on how the guidance committee is, is working, um, its latest product, then maybe we can begin with the questions and answers. How about that? Sure. Okay. Um, so we did <laughs> we did produce a guidance document, which hopefully most folks have seen. That's been yeah. out for quite a while now. Uh, there is a second document that will be released early in February that will continue to deal with um, the issues that we're working on now and also provide more detail to some of the things that were um, in the first document. Um, one sort of... Uh, I guess breaking news is that the pre-qualification application is out okay. and we are accepting applications and beginning to process those um, because we knew that one of the first things we needed to do was allow programs to begin to be uh, pre-qualified so we could work on capacity. Um, and Mel, you want to add some more? No, I think that uh, what we decided to do was rather than wait until we had all of the answers, we went forth and did uh, guidance part one. And it was a little Christmas gift for everyone, yeah. or Hanukkah, depending on which, cel which you celebrate. Um, <clears throat> and then we, we knew that we have a number of things that still needed to be sorted out. So, for example, the guidance around Title I, the Head, St uh, Head Start guidance also needed to be sorted out, and then also our pre-K regions, which we're just submitting now the report to the legislature as required before we actually um, finalize what the that guy uh, what those interim policies are going to be like so uh, so we will be trying to get that out uh, the be in a couple of weeks actually and then we'll also have a separate last time we had the Q&A um, the FAQs embedded within the guidance we're actually going to pull that out and keep adding to those um, to those particular topic headings with new questions that have arisen as we've moved forward. So that's going to be, again, coming out around the middle, the beginning and middle of, of February. Um, other than that, we are working on um, a TA plan and trying to figure out how, given the fact that we all have day jobs in addition to this, uh, wanting to figure out a way to provide the maximum amount of guidance. So what we opted to do, um, and I say this with a hint of uh, uh, resignation, because uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing webinars. And I think webinars have become what the PowerPoints were two years ago deadly. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> but it is a good and effective way of short. trying to get a short, short uh, trying to get as much information out in a way to as many people and then folks can follow up with additional questions and things of that nature. So we're going to be putting out a series of webinars focused on very specific topics and the audience is really anyone who would like to uh, come on with some probably some topics perhaps being more relevant to some people or another but it's uh, open to anyone who would like to do it working on how that's all actually going to um, how we're going to make sure that we have a platform that is not going to crash making sure we have all of those things are to be developed in the next couple of days and um, I, I will say one of the reasons we decided on that was um, a, because then we would have something that could be recorded that anybody could access at any time that they wanted mm -hmm. to. Um, we would encourage everyone, like particularly private providers, to look at all the webinars so that you have good information about what everybody's hearing. We're going to say the same things to public school partners so everybody gets, you know, the finances for everybody. Pre-qualification mm -hmm. is for everybody. So the more that everybody has the same answers, we think the better it is. Right. Um, I think Manuela says, she says that with some resignation because certainly we would prefer to go out and uh, visit every regional yes. council and uh, have a regional meeting. That 
I think we'll still get a chance to get out there and talk to people, but that will take a long time to get to every region. And we know that people want information more quickly. So um, it's not that people won't still see us uh, or have us travel around. It's just that we need to get the information out in a quicker way. And then we'll follow that up with some, some more face-to-face -face stuff as we move. Okay, ready for questions? Thank you. Yep. Okay, who has, who has questions? And I maybe suggest that you identify yourself for the benefit of the camera. Really? This, question's come, this question comes from Don Powers in the St. Johnsbury um, region. Uh, will there be will there be changes to the child care financial assistance program um, because of universal pre-K? Not at this time. Okay. That was easy. <laughs> Got another we'll one? I do. <laughs> ribbon. We'll leave that to the Blue Ribbon Commission. Okay. <laughs> Will the number of hours that are considered full-time be adjusted in the Child Care Financial Assistance Program? Not at this time. Okay. <laughs> so I have a, I have a question now um, that maybe you can't answer, not at this time. So give Come us, on, Tim. <laughs> Reva, give us some sense of how the, um, the, the slowdown in the rollout was received out in the world. Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I think a number of school districts and school boards um, uh, probably had a sigh of relief because they were trying to figure out how they're going to get their budgets and everything else in time for addressing the anticipated uh, surge of additional kids yep. within the time frame that they had in order to be able to have something to the voters that was really robust enough because you know part of it is also um, trying to estimate how many children may take advantage of this both in terms of continuing and uh, in a school-based program and also through partnerships now and doing. having to come up with the um, the state required um, the state required tuition. So I think they probably had a sigh of relief because of not having had enough time to work on all of this with having to rev up so quickly. Um, I think that some school districts, however, are um, hoping to move forward uh, with 2015. At this point, about a third of our supervisory mm -hmm. unions slash towns are about our planning at this time to move <coughs> forward and are submitting budgets to the voters that would reflect those increases. Um, obviously, we won't know exactly who is going to be able to move forward until after um, voters have a chance to vote on those budgets, but there is certainly still some momentum, so it isn't that everyone is waiting until 2016. Yep, got it. Thank and you. I think, can I just add to that, Tim, that I think um, one of the reasons that the decision was made um, to create it as an optional in the first year was that there was some worry that pushing it too hard might stall the whole thing. And mm -hmm. the response we had from almost everybody was, we think this is a good idea, we really want to do it, we just need more time. And we mm -hmm. had put that um, to the legislature during the session, and it just never got around to adjusting the date. So I think this, um, it'll be a little more interesting because it will be, um, a, you know, a, a, a staggered rollout, but at the same time we'll learn a lot and we hope it will add to the success. Great. Okay. Thank you. It doesn't really affect our time frame in terms of trying to get guidance out and rules completed and all of that because we'll need to have things in place for those early adopters that are moving forward with 2015. So in terms of our work behind the scenes and getting things ready from a policy perspective and everything else and TA perspective, that doesn't really alter the fact that we have an additional year. But it does provide some relief for those districts that were very concerned. Great. Thank you. Mary? Hi, Mary Burns. Um, I read the FAQ, and I'm still a little bit confused. So okay. um, the, the question was regarding um, school districts partnering with private providers. It talks about um, early implementation, 2015 implementation, then later implementation. And in Act 68, um, that bill was written so that 
private providers, it was included. They must partner with a private provider. There really wasn't a choice whether or not they could or couldn't. So I'm going to Act 62. Act 62, I'm okay. sorry. I'm a little concerned. Because Act 68 is school financing. I'm so sorry. No. And I know nothing <laughs> about school financing. Yeah, that's yeah, why I was going fine. to just you know, excuse myself as well. So um, <laughs> as a private provider, I'm just a little concerned that, you know, a year or two down the road, private providers will not be partnering with school districts mm -hmm. for the pre-K funding. Um, and if that's the case, I have grave concern. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start, Mary. Um, under Act 166, um, there still will be partnerships. And as a matter of fact, the parents will drive most of those partnerships. But for folks who don't choose to implement uh, immediately, we're assuming it'll be status quo, that they will have the same partnerships they have right now and will continue to move that forward. Uh, and then in, under Act 166, um, they have to partner with anyone that, that a parent in their district wants to send their child to unless they have a pre-K region and then it has to be within the pre-K region. And those are designed to protect the existing partnerships. So there's no intention to do away with partnerships under Act okay. 166. So the reason why I ask a question, Reva, is can I just read this to you? And maybe all, I'm just not sure. reading it um, the way it was intended. Gosh, I really it says for 2015-16, later adopters are not required to partner with all pre-qualified right. programs. Families and directors of those programs may request a partnership, mm -hmm. but the school district may decide whether to partner or not. Right. Later adopters will need to meet this requirement in subsequent years. Right. So basically what that is saying, and maybe it needs to be clarified because obviously if it was confusing, is that um, under Act 166, the school district doesn't have a choice. If a parent has their child uh, enrolled or planning to enroll in a child that is pre-qualified by the state, mm -hmm. then automatically the school district, unless again if it's outside of the pre-K region, the school district doesn't have any discretion. The school district has to provide the statewide tuition for that family to send their child to that pre-qualified program. Under Act 62, and this is what you're referring to, under Act 62, uh, what the school district basically did have, did have the discretion to determine that, yes, I'll partner with YMCA, no, I'm not going to partner with Carolyn's Red Balloon, for example. So they did have that, that discretion. Under Act 166, they do not have that discretion. And so, it, uh, if anything, Act 166 supports more partnerships, uh, but it does put families in the driver's seat because uh, typically what happens now uh, with your program and so on is that the school district has a partnership with your program. What will happen is basically that that partnership will continue, but the real mover and decider of that is our families and what uh, do they want. And uh, therefore, once they find their child um, a pre-qualified provider, unless it's outside of the pre-K region, even then they can request for the tuition to go to that child. But once they have their child in a pre-qualified program, the district does, can't say, oh, I don't, I don't like their program. Uh, they have to provide the tuition. So it actually supports and expands upon, and maybe that needs to be rewritten. I will look at it again. I think maybe what also confused me is I've heard that in Danville, they have, just, they have said they're not going to partner with private providers. Well, so it's just well, they, not, they may not be well informed at this point. Yes, I think there's a lot of misinformation or lack of information, should I say, and people are jumping to conclusions. Uh, that's not, and I don't know if they're going to be an early adopter or if they're going to wait until 2016. But if a family has a pre, uh, is uh, in St. Johnsbury, has their child enrolled in a pre-qualified program, if they are moving forward with 2015, now coming this fall, they would need to go ahead and establish a, an agreement with that program. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I'm going to do Trish and then Stacy. A little bit farther on, on the same topic because I had similar questions that Mary had. Um, you know, as a major employer that draws upon uh, employees from all over the state, um, how you answered the question, and, and it is clear that it's really family driven, but how and, and where are the pre kindergarten regions established? How and I think you sure. may have just said that you guys were working on that a little bit right now, but 
Yeah, it needs approval from and why? The I mean, why the differentials so, yeah. between family-driven and then established? Regions? So under the statute, uh, a school board may request or propose a pre-kindergarten region in order to protect local access. There was concern during the um, during the discussions around the legislation that if all the kids in a particular community, if all the parents took their kids somewhere else because they commuted, that people who lived in the community the programs there might fail, and then they would no longer have any access in the community. And so um, the, the provision around the, the ability for a school board to say, we want to create a pre-kindergarten region. It can't be, so far we know or, or proposed, that it's no smaller than, the dis than a school district. Um, it can be as large as 10 districts, the supervisory union. Um, but they would propose that based on the um, on maintaining local access for kids. And then um, the agencies will consider that proposal, looking at the data about supply and demand, um, and, uh, and also having a, some kind of a public hearing in the community about whether or not other folks support that pre-K region. Um, and then we would be able, we would potentially approve it or not. And so again, it's, it's locally driven, we don't know exactly how many will be coming forward. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we have a report that was written for the legislature that they requested, uh, and we had a stakeholder group talking about what should the criteria be. That report outlines the criteria that we're proposing. Um, the legislature will look at that, and then, then we'll uh, hopefully move forward with our guidance around the regions. We're preparing an application for school boards at this time. But it really is based around local access, that a local program would not close. Um, and some of that is based on the behavior of parents, which um, is something we can all speculate on, but I would assume many parents will want to keep their kids locally. So, um, so some of that is just some fear that was there about that. And again, protecting local access is important because if somebody doesn't commute out of their town and they don't have transportation and the, there's not a capacity to maintain a program in their town, then they won't have access either. So that was the original uh, basis of it. So it's a process. It's an application that they need to do. So it's not anything that we set up. It's things which are decided at the local level if they want to make that request to the secretaries. It's coming from the local families and so on. It has taken consideration uh, the number of pre-qualified programs, and it also has to look at what is the bordering community as well. So it's a bit of a data gathering and uh, proving, uh, uh, having a justification as to why you want to establish it. So it isn't something which we set up at all. And I have heard from some supervisory unions that they have no intention of setting up a pre-K region. So um, it really does depend in terms of the, you know, where we are. And the uh, one thing that uh, I thought my mother would pick up, because she almost always picks up the things I forget, what? is that the, uh, the law and the, uh, and the proposed rules say that the region must be established to protect existing partnerships. Yes. So we're not expecting that people will be carving out folks they already partner with. Thank you. I'm slipping. I, th I forgot it as I finished and figured you'd pick it up. Stacy. Right. Um, yeah, just following on that, this might fall outside of the implementation of TEAM, but I'm wondering about if you can speak a little bit to what support is being offered to families to make sure if the families are the drivers here, and it sounds like it's not in a way some things are changing dramatically, but also maybe not changing at all, what, what resources are available that we can point people to so that families really know what's going on? I think at this time, we don't have everything in a row, all our ducks in a row, or pheasants, or whatever it is. Um, so I think that we haven't done a lot, although I get calls from families wondering to know more about it. And right now, with this staggered start date, it becomes even more complicated. It was easier to answer those questions in, in October, because we knew that all of the school districts would be moving into Act 166, July 1 of 2015. Now, uh, the response that I would have given has to be always tempered by, depending on when your district decides to opt to, uh, and also when your voters, um, you know, what your voters do with the school budget as well. So there's two pieces there. So right now, it's really, uh, we don't have a lot to share at this moment. 
Uh, but people have read the newspaper, um, especially when there was a lot of press around Act 166, and that's when a bulk of the, of the calls came in. Um, so I think that um, we'll be getting more of those calls. It would be great to have partners who were also working on helping to communicate that. Um, and I think that um, you know things like articles and press releases and so on are really very helpful. But right now we're a little bit of a flux without knowing who's actually moving forward and who isn't. We are doing a little work on this. Um, number one, one of the things that the that the law says and that the rules again will the proposed rules um, uphold is that the town has a responsibility to inform parents in its town yeah. of what is available to them. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the delayed implementation does complicate right. uh, those things a great deal. However, since each town's deciding that. Um, we will be pushing those towns who are implementing to make sure that people are well informed about implementing. Um, we are also um, talking with the folks at Building Bright Futures about developing fact sheets specifically for parents, you know, because we're moving on such a role with a lot of the legal and formal stuff that working with some of our partners to develop fact sheets that we can stand behind for parents, for providers, for schools. Um, so we're working on that stuff. And we're working on, again, we have a pretty good list of who we think is moving forward. Um, again, that depends on their budgets, so that won't be confirmed until March. But at some point, we will be able to say clearly which districts are moving forward and which are not, which will help in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, but that probably won't be till March once all the budgets. So we're, you know, we're sort of doing a lot of behind the scenes work because we have the same concern. Um, it, we just don't have a lot. It's hard to say something crystal clear. Um, I will say I don't get the calls to the degree that Manuela does, but she very graciously accepts calls and answers individual questions on a very regular basis. Not saying everybody pick up the phone and call Manuela, but no doubt. Um, they, when they call, she answers that. And then again, the FAQs and the fact sheets will be designed to try to start um, sussing out that information as clearly as we can. It, just as a follow, I think that will be after all the everything is ironed out. Probably one of the most important mm -hmm. steps in all of this, because I mean, I even think about parents currently um, at UVM, or even you know, just with the little bit of information they're getting, they're confused and questions. And I just think about accessibility and um, how I think our regional councils could hopefully be helpful and reaching people that and families that aren't currently <coughs> under care mm -hmm. and probably don't maybe don't have access to some of these fact sheets or different mm -hmm. modes of mm -hmm. communication that really could be impacted. And it will be trickiest for providers who are dealing with school districts who both are moving forward and are not mm -hmm. um, because they'll they'll be working with partners who have d sort of different guidance and so we are prepared to work with folks who are working in those contexts so that we can give them whatever help we can. Um, and the other thing I think that um, I had something that the law said that I've now forgotten. So um, well, I think you're right, right in terms. You were right in terms of this. Although there's a lot more state administration and state re requirements uh, around Act 166, the reality is that the actual implementation and administration of Act 166 remains at the local level. So families register at the local level. Uh, families find a program at the local level. So what we're trying to do is trying to get greater consistency by being one place where you have to be vetted to make sure that you are pre-qualified and posting that and that kind of stuff. So, so I'm hopeful, actually. And confusion has reigned ever since we passed 62. So, and people still don't understand 62. So, so I'm hopeful that with uh, 166, that if we do it right, that there'll be less confusion ultimately. But um, I did I want to just add that um, that I think the important thing is making sure that the folks who are implementing Act 166 and and administering it, which is the school districts, that they know exactly what they should be doing and can't be doing so that there isn't um, uh, errors being said, like comments made, like we don't have to partner with anyone. You know, I mean, that's a total violation of, but it's, I don't fault them. I just think that it's something that we need to correct mm -hmm. and get clear understanding across the board because ultimately the responsibility now, is, 
is actually with the um, the local school districts, and that's where families need to go to register, et cetera. There's plenty of reasons to partner based on the, what's in the act. And, and well, it's also a, a have to. And Manuela yeah. reminded me what, of what I was going to say. Another thing that the act did that's actually moving forward for everyone is um, in the first set of guidance, we talked about the things that are moving forward, and one is prequalification. Mm -hmm. So the standards around prequalification have not essentially changed between Act 62 and Act 166. However, every, um, everyone who's going to offer pre-K under any public funding must pre-qualify that so the application is out there and available to folks and then one of the things that folks asked us for which we've not previously been able to do is a way for families to find pre-qualified programs mm -hmm. and so now they'll be able to go into the bright futures information system where they would go to find a child care program and they can search for a pre-qualified program and that will be available to them online and we think that's going to be really helpful for school districts and for families and for everyone to know who's been through the process has met the standards, and is pre-qualified to offer. And that's all happening for everyone, regardless mm -hmm. of when they implement this year. Right. Okay. We're going to do one more question on this topic. Malika, did you have your hand up? Are you trying to get in there? I, I, I think it's answered, and I, I think it's at a lower level than this. Um, okay. Thank you. And anyone else? Mark, you want yeah, to jump? <coughs> no. And then Eddie. Okay, and Eddie. I'll let you guys be one. Okay. You just get a half a we question. are one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so Mark Sustic, the uh, if we stepped away from 166 for a moment and thought about pre-K for all, and thought about more than the school year, more than 10 hours a week, et cetera, and partnerships with folks, and we even thought that pre-K maybe includes birth to three, if we think about anything before pre-K, do you see 166 as a path as now part joining of the, as a part of the pathway to get you there, or is there are there are there other avenues to get to this bigger picture that success by I mean success by six building bright futures might be thinking about in a bigger in a bigger view of of where we're headed with this. Do you, do you see 166 as an efficient, good way, good milestone to get us to a bigger a bigger piece? I certainly see Act 166 as a really important milestone. Okay. The achievement of universality is really um, is really critical. And I know even for us, sitting on the implementation team, as we started to look through rules, we'd go, oh, gosh, that's right. They're entitled to pre-K. Like, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Is it everything we ever wanted, you know, is going down this bifurcated path the best idea? Well, anybody who doesn't agree with that myself included, um, lost that battle a long time ago, and so you have to make progress where you can make progress. And I think that, um, I think that Vermont has made huge progress in passing this law. And when we start thinking, started thinking about implementing it, it is a little mind-blowing when you go to the every single kid's entitled uh, conversation. So it, it, it's not everything, but it's, I think it's a good it's step a along the path. place to be yes. on our way. Right. Yep. And we're very, very excited. Yep. We are trying to keep these separate, but I'm going to mention it yep. anyways, that we got the pre-K expansion grant because we think that that's a way yep. for us to figure out some of those other things even while we begin to roll out yeah, let me Act just make 66. A, I'll say this sort of personal editorial <coughs> comment that often the, the uh, rules and regulations end up being uh, implementing the destination in and of itself rather than looking at the the ultimate destination we might be headed to. Okay? Can I just respond as yeah. well? Sure. So Act 166 is actually built uh, upon the Act 62. So basically what the legislature did was um, crossed out <coughs> a bunch of things in 62 and wrote in universal access. Um, and I can see in a few years um, Act 166 as being several pieces crossed out mm -hmm. and increasingly looking at the full continuum of early childhood. I could see that happening. I may be retired well, by then, but, <laughs> but, but I could see that happening uh, because yeah. we have that precedent from 62 moving into evolving into 166, and the next one will probably be something in the 200s. That's good to hear. So, Eddie, I'm going to ask you to hold your I question hold for afterwards, maybe, yeah. um, since our, our agenda here is getting kind of tight.